2012. Already two weeks into the new year. How many of you are having a good year so far? I'm having a great year. These first two weeks have been all about the presence of the Lord in my life. It's been wonderful. Today, specifically, I mean, from the very moment I woke up, there he was. He led me through the day, had a great day, and ministered in another church this morning, Shekinah Assembly of God. We had a great time. They're very involved in missions. I was excited about that. I told them about Cambodia. They want to get in on that. And they uh, soon, probably this coming month, will be sending a team in to stay at our house there and uh, find out what they can do. They're very active in missions, so that's a, it's good news. And I've connected them with other ministries before also, and they are still serving those ministries. And so praise God. It's exciting to see the body of Christ come together and I like being a networker, helping connect people to other people so that they can all find exactly what it is that the Lord has for their ministries and for their lives. In fact, that's what I said to them this morning. I was talking about running the race message on. I taught part of that message here about the race that's set for us, you know, that we need to stay that course that we have that's lined up. And so I encourage them to stay on the course because obviously the Lord's put on their hearts, just like all of us, certain things. And we want to run the good race, and we want to run the race according to the parameters that the Lord sets out for us, whatever His will is. And uh, we're staying in the Word. Many of you enjoying the Bible in one year that we're doing, the audio, whether you read it or you listen to it, I encourage you to keep listening. I see some really good responses from people and get good reports. People wake up in the morning, they're becoming dependent upon it, and just they're like addicted to it already. It takes 21 days form a habit. I don't know if you knew that, but according to psychologists, it takes 21 days, three weeks. And I think if you do something every day for 21 days, it's very hard to stop doing it. And so that's what I'm committed, or at least hope that people are committed to do this. 21 days, just listen to the scriptures, and then if you go on the 22nd day, you're going to need it. You're going to say, I need to listen to the scripture here. So we stay in the Word. The Word is our strength. It is a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path. Excited about everything the Lord's going to do. Right now, I just want to invite the presence of the Lord here with us. He's already here. We've had a wonderful time of preparation and anticipation of all of you coming. And the Lord blessed us. He poured His Spirit out on us so that we could be ready to lead you guys into the presence of the Lord. And it's exactly what we're going to do. So let's pray. Father, we love you and we thank you that you are already in this place. In spirit, you're here with us, but we want to let you know that you are welcome. You're welcome here in our midst, Lord. You're welcome in this place. We will not stop you or hinder you in any way from doing what you wish to do in us. We yield to you, Lord. We yield to the Spirit of God. We ask that the Holy Spirit would flow and move, operating in us and on us and through us throughout this service. Lord, we put no restrictions, no boundaries, no borders, no lines in the sand of drawn. We erase all the things that would stop you and hinder you. We will not hinder the Spirit in any way, but we yield. Holy Spirit, move in this place. Bring us strength. Bring us courage, Lord. Bring us healing. Yes. Bring us deliverance, Lord. Yes. Let us all be very aware of the reality of the presence of the Holy One in this place, Lord right now. We turn our attention toward you, Almighty God. We turn our attention toward you, Holy Spirit. We look at you, Lord. We turn away from this world and we decide to, in this moment, in this place, interrelate with you and be intimate with you. So, Lord, have your way. Have your way, Holy One. And do whatever you want in this meeting. In Jesus' name, we pray. If you agree with me, say amen to the Lord. Why don't we stand our feet as we give a hand clap of praise to the Lord. Always. 
ways are good. All your ways are good. All your ways are pure. I will trust in you alone. You in my side, high above my life. I will trust in you Bye.
moment of praise. The spirit of heaviness. And when we praise Him, when we worship Him, we, we suddenly find ourselves being wrapped in a robe. And the spirit of heaviness weights of this world, the concerns of this world, they have to leave. They cannot abide in the same place as the presence of the King. They cannot abide in the same place. We put on the garment of praise, the Spirit of Heaven.
presence like a like a crystal stream. Of the Lord 
Gabriel came and he brought that news telling Zechariah that your wife will conceive and she's going to have a child and the child's going to be great and we all know how great John the Baptist was and he was a forerunner that went ahead of Jesus to prepare the way. Wonderful ministry. But Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, he had a real hard time accepting it. And so he said, you know, how can this be since we are so old? Immediately looking at the negative, immediately thinking about what was not possible. And the response, what caught my eye was the response of Gabriel. As soon as he said, how can this be? The angel stood and stared at him and said, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. Is there anything too difficult for God? And I realized that from the perspective of Gabriel, you see, Gabriel was a servant of God in heaven, actually standing in the presence of God. Seeing through eternity all the things that God was doing, that nothing was impossible. And I realized that it was a matter of perspective. The things from inside the presence of the Lord look completely different than things look from outside the presence of the Lord. And of course the doubt caused Zacharias to have to be mute. The Lord was angry and Gabriel said, you know what, just shut up and you're not going to talk again until the child is born. Salted because he knew the fullness and the greatness and the majesty and the power of Almighty God. And he knew that there was nothing impossible for him. Later, the same angel Gabriel went to Mary to bring news to her that Mary, highly favored of the Lord, you, you are the one through whom. God is going to bring his own son into the world. The Spirit of the Lord will come upon you. You will bear a child. And, and, and Mary had trouble with it too. And she said, how can it be? I'm just a virgin. I've never known a man. And Gabriel, Gabriel stood there again. I can just hear him saying the same thing. I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of the Lord. Is there anything impossible for God? matter of perspective, whatever problems you have, whatever difficulties you're facing, I want you to look at them from the perspective of the presence of God. Look at them from inside of the cloud of glory. Don't look at them with your natural eyes. Don't look at them from your own mind and your own understanding, but look at them from God's perspective and know that there is nothing impossible. in this place. We thank you, Lord, for all that you're about to do in this night. And that there's no limit to what can be achieved if we only believe. So we believe tonight. Even as we go to your word, let the Holy Spirit speak to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Cambodia, we went into Phnom Penh, and there we are making some plans and strategies and the things that we want to do uh, for the Lord and with the Lord in that place. And I took Valerie, and you can come up now. I took Valerie in so that she could see, and she's going to come up with some plans and some things to help us all organize to make regular trips in and out. And she's not going to give you that plan right now. She's just going to come and share a little bit about her experiences. Come her experience in there. So everybody welcome Mallory. Um, well, I'm, I really know how to start this. Um, actually, I wasn't very
very excited to go into Cambodia. <laughs> um, well, it started when Stephen um, was talking about Cambodia last year, and I felt a little tug. It's just a little tug, and um, 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 weeks later, I mentioned it to him uh, while we were on the way to the camp. I just sort of, you know, casually spoke to him, mentioned it. And the, the month of December is really like um, a lot of things that happen, a lot of, um, it's like the Lord is preparing me for things that's happening, things, you know, things are happening to my life, he spoke to me. And well, when, when, when the Lord says that, you know, that, that he's going to give me a ministry, I was thinking in my heart, okay, yeah, I'll be fine, you know, June is coming, I'm going for the program, I've signed up for it, and well, things might happen there, I'm prepared for that. I'm prepared for after June. <laughs> Not <laughs> January. <laughs> so in January when, when Stephen mentioned, um, you know, he's going to Cambodia, would you like to come along? Uh, my spirit said yes. <laughs> and I asked George, he said, okay, go ahead. And I put the ticket for Anne and myself. And I, and I announced it um, calmly to Stephen. And after he said that, okay, I'm good for you, you know, the Lord has been speaking, or whatever. And, <laughs> suddenly, suddenly it's like reality sets in and, I, and my mind took over I'm like, oh no, what about my children? I've got two young kids, you know, and, and I'm going to be gone for two days. Yeah, it's very short, but for a mother of two young children, it's like, oh, you know, what's going to happen? They, they stay with, they sleep with me at night. What's going to happen? So I, for three days, I cried. <laughs> the minute I went to the, 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 the private room with the Lord, I just closed the door and I <laughs> cried, and I cried, and I cried, and I wept. Sounds silly, but well, if you're a mother, or probably you understand better. So, anyway, after three days, I mean, because things are, seem so unreal to me, uh, I still don't know why I'm going. I just felt led and I agreed, you know. But after that, you know, during these three three days, I didn't know why I'm, I'm feeling this way, like I'm in a I'm in a dream or something. And I asked the Lord, Lord, what happened? Why am I feeling this way? It's so strange. Um, and the Lord revealed to me. Now the thing is, I always felt that I am serving the Lord. I am working, serving in GMB, God's permission to the blind. I am serving the Lord. I'm not out of His will. I'm serving Him. I'm taking care of my children. And I thought that was the best arrangement, you know. <laughs> best arrangement, yes. And my, I, I'm, I'm pretty comfortable. I was pretty comfortable in my boat. Suddenly, my boat just rocked. <laughs> you know, what? <laughs> that's what happened to me. And my, all my questions, all the questions in my mind was like oh, horrendous. Okay, now to cut the thing short, we went there and we went to the we went to the Bankota house. That's where the children's home. Um, that's that's the children's home there. Uh, we we got connected to Stephen to uh, to the 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 Rhonda and Mark. And we, we visited children. And there's this boy who came to me, his name is Sammy, and he just came to me and stretched out his arms and wanted me to carry it. So I just carried. The moment I carried him, I was filled with compassion. I was so burdened. I began to cry. I began to cry before the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Have mercy on them. Have mercy on this boy. Have mercy on the children. It was such a great compassion. I, I just felt so pain in within me. Um, and then we also visited Water of Life, um, the ministry, and we were just talking to Randy. And when we were talking to him, he, this this guy just came, this young young boy just came in. Randy just gave him a hug, just a hug while talking to us. Something happened to me. I felt like. I felt that this love just came over me, overwhelmed me, and I began to, I began to, I began to laugh, I began to rest, I was, I don't know what happened to me. And Anne just looked at me and, okay, she continued <laughs> talking to, to Randy. <laughs> and I just quickly sat one side and, and I felt the love of God in this place. Uh, I was still struggling, I just said, you know, I don't know when I'm coming, I don't know why I'm here. Yes, I know a little bit, but it's just like it's like 
You know, during these three days, the Lord opens up the door. Hey, this is the next step. He opens up the door for me to see his heart, where his heart, where is his burden, and where he wants me to go. And um, so during these three days, I shared with Anne and Stephen that, you know, I, I felt the burden of the Lord, and they were laughing at me, well, I felt the burden of the Lord. I felt, I felt as if now I have another set of babies in Cambodia. And, and so I was telling them, you know, I, now I have two sets of babies, one, my two children, and now I have more, I have more over this side. I felt that I need to come back, but I'm still negotiating with the Lord. I didn't want, didn't want to give any commitment yet. Yeah. And but I do feel that I do feel very comfortable in this land, which is which was my first time. And I've gone to other uh, other places, but somehow I felt very comfortable in this place. Okay. So anyway, I came back and. I struggled a bit. The Lord spoke to me. There's one verse that the Lord spoke very clearly to me while I was in Cambodia. I just want to quickly um, read it out and uh, just quickly share uh, what He spoke to me. And that's in John chapter 17, verse 3 in Amplified Version. And this is eternal life. It means to know, to perceive, recognize, become acquainted with, and understand you, the only true and real God, and likewise to know Him, Jesus, as the Christ, the Anointed One, the Messiah, whom you have sent. The words that stared very hard at me were to perceive, to recognize, and to understand you. It was like God is saying, you know, perceive. You know, to understand, and <laughs> well, I, 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 it's, it's like in my spirit, I know, when, when you know, the Lord is calling you to do something, but you're not doing. There's this constant struggle within you. So there's this struggling, struggle, struggle, struggle. Finally, on Thursday, I said, Lord, I surrender. I let you take me wherever you want to go. I don't know how long, how often. I don't know what is it in future, but I surrender. I just let you take me wherever you want to go. Right, and of course, I asked my husband, and without any hesitation, he said, "Okay." <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So, so that was that was my 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 journey there. Um, somebody said, "Are you were you, were you uh, happy? Were you excited?" I don't know. Um. It was like, it was like, it was like, you know, you're going to a high school, you're going to a foreign land, a university for the first time, and you don't know what to expect. But when you are there, when I'm there, actually I knew what the Lord wants me to do. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. She, she's going to take these desires also, she's going to put them into some uh, structure in the sense that uh, we're gonna, she knows the needs, she wrote down, she investigated a lot about the needs of the ministry, so she's gonna find ways that we can collectively meet the needs there by going in, teaching, helping. Some of you have already been to those areas, you've been to Cambodia and you know it, uh, but some of you have not, and so we would like for everybody to participate in that and be able to be a part of, of what God's doing in all the nations, not only Cambodia, but other nations also. We're gonna continue to expand and go, and meantime also here, we're gonna to continue to learn, and uh, this work, of course, Singapore is very important, and we're working here, the Lord has me tied down here to continue to minister to this nation, and we're gonna keep doing that as we grow, but we're gonna also be constantly involved in, in missions. You know, we th think of the nations like food item. You know, you don't eat just one thing on your plate. It's nice to have a mix of things. So the, the planet is a buffet and we can eat from all the nations and participate and grow. And so I, I'm looking forward to our involvement there. We have a couple of guests with us tonight, all the way from Mexico, who have been working in Cambodia for a while. I would like them to come up. Angel and Carmen, I'd like you to come. They, they are 
a wonderful couple that have left everything behind and in their nation to go and work in Cambodia and, and specifically to work in Phnom Penh. And we've seen them over the last couple of years. And so we're really blessed by what the Lord has done. So I just wanted them to come and greet you. Saludar a la gente, compartir algo, que un, un saludo y también si, si tienen un, una palabra o algo, puede, pero más que todo testificar un poquito de lo que están haciendo ahí. Pues, and I'm going to translate the best that I can into uh, English. Hola, estamos muy contentos de estar con ustedes. And we're very happy to be with you, with all of you. Es emocionante e impactante este lugar. It is emotional and impacting this place. Desde que entré allí yo sentí la presencia from del the, Espíritu Santo muy fuerte. From the moment that I walked in over there, I felt the, the presence of the Holy Spirit very strongly. Yeah. Yo puedo percibir cuando entro en algún lugar la realidad de Dios. I can perceive the reality of God when I enter into a place. Mi Dios es real aquí. And God is real in this place. Yeah. Acabamos de conocer a un hombre muy importante. Uh, we've, we've to know an important man. Y parece que nos puso Dios en nuestra en nuestro camino. Uh, well, we just met a very important man, and it appears that the Lord has put us in His path, and put him in our path. Y nos estuvo dando mucha palabra. And uh, we, we mucha palabra acerca de, de nuestra and he, vida. He had a lot of word, prophetic word, to share with us. Yo estoy aquí por un problema que tenía de enfermedad. Uh, I'm here because there was a problem that I had physically with my body. But I believe that today is my day of liberty. And Yo amo a Dios y quiero servir a Jesús por siempre, por los días que, por el tiempo que me quede. I, I, I love God and I want to serve Jesus for all the time that I have here on earth. Hace cinco años salimos de nuestro país, de México. Five years ago we left from our country, Mexico. Nosotros no sabíamos, no, conocí, no teníamos ninguna iglesia, ningún conocido en Camboya. Uh, we didn't have any known church or any contacts there in Cambodia. Solo salimos como Abraham sin saber para dónde ir. Uh, we were like Abraham, we just, we didn't quite know where, but we went in obedience. Pero estos cinco años han sido años de milagros y prodigios. And these five years have been years of miracles and signs. Yo pensé que ya conocía mucho acerca de Dios y de la obra de Dios. Uh, I believe that I've learned a lot about God and, and the work of God. Pero estoy conociendo, estoy empezando a conocer algo nuevo, una nueva dimensión de parte de Dios. And I believe that I knew a lot in the past, but now I'm learning a whole new dimension of, of God and His work. Yo podía orar por enfermos y predicar en grandes congregaciones. I've been able to pray for the sick and preach in different congregations. Pero hoy me he a mi, a mi fe de Dios. And, but now I've been uh, confronted concerning my faith toward God. And the Lord is calling me to trust in Him more. Porque Dios te lleva de nivel en nivel. Because the Lord takes you from level to level. Y cuando llegas a un, un tope, siempre quiere que pases al otro nivel. And, and when you come to, to an obstacle, it means that he's trying to take you to a, another level. Pero depende de nosotros si damos el siguiente paso. And it, but it depends upon us and our, and our willingness to take the next step. Y yo quiero dar hoy en el nombre de Jesús. And, and I want to uh, share that tonight in the name of Jesus. Y yo creo que tú también lo puedes dar tú ahora. I'm sorry? También lo puedes dar tú hoy. And also you can, you can do forgive. Todos los retos y todo lo que viene de, de, del futuro, Dios va a tener cuidado de ti. Uh, everything that, that, that in your future, in the Lord, the Lord's going to take care of. Porque Dios es bueno. Because God is good. Gracias. No hay nada imposible para Dios. There is nothing impossible for God. Nosotros estamos hoy aquí, nada es that we are here is, is just the proof of that, that there's nothing impossible. God, God is good all the time. And all the time, God is good. Praise God. It sounds like a Don Moen CD. God is good all the time. Put us all the praise in his heart. And you know that real country version? I like that version. I like, you guys like country music? Oh, yeah, I, can yeah. do, I can do country music. I can sing country until the sun goes down. <laughs> but I won't. No. <laughs> Not my favorite style. I do, I do like it. Praise God Almighty. We have a message tonight that I want to share with you. Something the Lord put on my heart starting uh, yesterday. 
and uh, actually yesterday I put it together and then in the morning uh, the Spirit of the Lord brought some freshness to it. I created the outline yesterday for it and the Lord kind of brought it to life and it comes out of the daily scriptures that we've been reading and, and that's what I'm trying to do. Of course, I can't put God in a box of our daily reading but I'm intending to take all of the messages throughout this year from the passages that we are collectively reading day by day so that you can kind of feel connected to that. And the title of this message is Sent to Serve. Sent to Serve. And it comes from Matthew chapter 10, verses 1 through 20. And we begin an introduction by saying that the ministry of Jesus is a wonderful source of information for us today. And we can learn everything we need to know about serving God here on earth from the very visible patterns found throughout the Gospels. In fact, that's what we're doing right now on Saturdays. We are going through the Gospels in a harmony of all the Gospels together. And I have isolated all of the events. In other words, everything that happened in, around, before and after the ministry of Jesus Christ, every event, every happening listed in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and some of the letters that say things that are not clearly defined in the letters, we're also going to put those there so that every event, and you know, everything is quantifiable in the Word. So you may be interested to know that I have identified 393 events. And we are going to systematically cover every single one of them. And we, we got up, what number did we get up to on Saturday? We made the number six after two hours of classes. So you know we're in for a long ride. 393 things. And, and the first six were glorious. We had a wonderful time. The Lord was here with us. And so that's what I mean when I say that the ministry of Jesus is a wonderful source of information. We can learn so much from looking at his time on earth and what he did. And as I was studying the passage in Matthew chapter 10, where Jesus sends out his disciples, I was reminded of how the Lord had led me in life and ministry. And we can learn from what Jesus did. And the way that he's called me, the way that he separated me, what he did in my life to bring me where I am today. And as I looked at that chapter, it's one of my favorite chapters. In fact, chapter 9, before we get into chapter 10, is, is such a pivotal moment in the end of that passage. In Matthew chapter 9, verse 36, we know that the Lord Jesus was moved with compassion when he looked on the multitudes and he saw that they were spread abroad, they were dispersed or scattered like sheep that did not have a shepherd. And because of this, it caused Jesus to experience a physical pain. We actually preached out of that passage some time ago when we talked about compassion. He had that compassion which caused him to double over in pain. And that's what the word meant. And as a result, he turned to his disciples and said, pray to the Lord of the harvest that he'd send forth laborers into his harvest field. And that was the last thing he said in chapter 9. And the first thing he says in chapter 10, we'll see in a moment, is, is that he calls his disciples to send them. And so it's a pivotal moment when the disciples are no longer disciples, but become apostles. And, and that's so important to me because there was a moment in my ministry, in my life, where that transition occurred. Where I was formally doing everything, running and completing the missions and the, and the programs. And I did everything. I was a one-man band. You picture me like one of those one-man band guys that have the cymbals between their knees and a, and a drum over here and a tambourine in this hand. And I'm blowing a kazoo. I was doing everything. And it was very difficult. There were other people that were peripheral, but really I was taking care of everything. And, and, and honestly, I was a jack of all trades and a master of none, as my grandmother used to tell me. A jack of all trades, a master of none. I mean, I didn't have any specific, specific expertise. I didn't excel in one area, but I could do everything and I had to do everything. And I still am that way in some respects as a church planter, but the Lord commissioned me and said, you know what, all of this would have been for nothing if you don't reproduce yourself. That happened to me years ago. And when the Lord spoke it to me, He spoke it to me out of this passage that we're talking about. And, and especially the end of chapter 9 of Matthew. And I realized I need to reproduce myself 
if I'm going to do that. And other people need to do the things that I've done. And, and this pattern is true here because, you know, we are all sent to serve. And in this message, we're going to see seven things that Jesus gives us when he sends us to serve. And as he sends us out into this world in service, there's seven things we're gonna, that I identified in Matthew chapter 10 in verses 1 through 20. And I want us to go through those. So we start with number one. Jesus gives us a call. And you give someone a call by ringing their phone and calling them. Or you can yell from across the street. If you ever see someone from across the way and you can yell out to them. Of course, that's not very common here in Singapore because you're very controlled people. and you don't. But in the U.S., oh, it is very common. We will yell across a crowded restaurant, Hey, John! And everyone will look like, what's he yelling at? But we don't care because we're loud, boisterous people because we're Americans. So we're, we're really loud. And, you know, hey, is that Nancy over there? And we say, I don't know, isn't it? Nancy! We yell it out, and Nancy turns around. Hi, Stephen, how are you doing? And we will have conversations <laughs> with each other across a sea of people. And everybody else, you know, they really don't care because they're also American. But here in Singapore, it's less likely true. <laughs> But Jesus calls us when he calls out to us like he did to his disciples. And that's where we begin in verse 1 of Matthew. It says he called his 12 disciples to him. And this is the first thing of the seven things we're going to identify that he gives us. He gives us a call. And when I say a call, I mean a calling. I mean a vocation. And the word is the same Greek word as this word used in this verse that we use for calling. It comes from the same root. It's the same. He called his 12 disciples to him. And Jesus had been with them for quite a while. And they had never been commissioned to do anything other than follow. In fact, I did a message sometime back about following Jesus. And we saw the stories in the places where people followed him. And there's a lot of patterns to, be, to see there. But up to this point, that's all they were good at was following. But now things were about to change. We start this way in our life in Christ. But the time comes when he calls us apart to serve and begin to do the job that others formerly had done. And this is very important to think of it this way. There are jobs that must be done. There are tasks that must be performed on earth and God wants them done. And the question is, who is going to do the jobs? And so some elite individuals, not because they are special, but because they are yielded more than anything, they end up doing all the jobs. And they rise as leaders. So they end up with a full group of jobs they have to do that makes them very busy. But if they are real successful, they will delegate those jobs to other people so those people can take those jobs. I've been doing a lot of things for Jesus. I've been preaching and teaching and operating in realms of the Spirit in unique ways. But now it's time for other people to do exactly that. I've done this before. I've imparted the gifts of the Spirit that God gave me in the past years. I've done it in India. I've done it in Mexico. I give these things and therefore make disciples so that those people can take the same power and do the same jobs that are spiritual jobs that I have done. That's why I had formerly done those, but I'm not even in Mexico anymore, but the job's getting done. In fact, the job is getting done better than I had been able to do it. Why? Because that's the way the Lord grows His kingdom. That our children will always excel beyond us. If we can deposit in them because they carry what we've already produced and worked on and they bring it to another level and that should be our desire for them and their desire for themselves. Our mentors are in our life to show us what we must emulate and reproduce. At least the good parts of our mentors. If your mentor happens to pick his nose a lot, you don't want to emulate that character. Hey, I picked up an anointing from my pastor. A nose picking. No, that's a bad habit. So you don't want to do that. You know, if your pastor was very fond of passing wind everywhere, you know, you go, I want to be just like my pastor. No, you don't, you don't want to do that. Do you want to take the good characteristics, the good qualities, you know, the things that the Lord has 
that, that he puts in mentors and, and those are the things you want to emulate. And that's what I'm talking about. Now, you know, there was nothing wrong with Jesus. So Jesus was a pure source as a mentor and they had been following him to this point. But see, this call is all about them being separated to take his place. And this is where it all started. This is where the rubber met the road. Up to then, they were just along for the rod, but suddenly the tables turn. Not long after this is when Jesus starts messing with them. And the, the crowd comes in one group. He's saying, we have to feed these multitudes. And he just tells them what to do. Fine, we need loaves and fishes. They get them, they bring them to him. But then finally, he feeds the group again in a different place. And he turns to them and he says, what are you going to feed them? And that was a shocking day for them, but that was part and parcel of what was taking place in this transition was suddenly, you watched me do it, now what are you going to do? And that's important that we consider that that is what the call of God is. When you become a part of the church, you were counted as one called out to separate from this world in service of the Most High God. This is what the word church means. We've talked about it. Ecclesia. Ec means out. Ecclesia means call. That's the word translated church. Call out. Out of darkness into the light. But why does he want us out of the darkness into the light? Because in the light we receive the instructions. In the light we are made aware of the kingdom so that we can function. That we can do the things that he's called us to do. This is the calling. And it's important that we esteem what he's doing in a calling. It's important that we look at it as important that we place value on the commission of God or the thing that he's told us to do. Look at Ephesians chapter 4 verse 1. As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you, I'm begging you, please, to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. And, and you know, if, if we have to be told to walk worthy of the calling then we can conclude that we are capable of walking unworthy of it. Meaning that there's people that are called, and Jesus, I think, calls everybody. Many are called, few are chosen, it says. Of course, that's speaking of salvation, but I think it applies also to us as believers in ministry. I think he has a task, and he wants everyone to do it, but not everyone is going to respond in the right way. Not everyone's going to walk worthy of the vocation of God. And that's why Paul was urging them. It doesn't often say, I urge you from the Pauline letters. But here's a case. It was important enough for him to say, I'm pleading with you, please. And that's what it was. Walk worthy. And so we must strive to do everything possible to live in a manner equal in value to the task that God gives us here on earth. You understand? I'm going to read that again. We must strive to do everything possible to live in a manner equal in value to the task that God gives us here on earth. Uh, I, I quote Pastor Butch LeBeau often. He had something he said I was very fond of. He said that our character must rise to the level of our anointing. When the anointing comes upon us, he gives you the anointing and power for your ministry to do everything you need, but you are still not a perfect person. But he says, be ye perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect, meaning that it is up to you to walk worthy of the call of God on you, walk worthy of the anointing, because that's about, he calls them together, and this calling is so that he can impart to them the anointing. You're going to see that in a moment. And he, he wants them to have the power in the anointing to do the task that he's been doing. In other words, the same power that was on Jesus, he's getting ready to pass it to them in the portion necessary for them to start to do his job. And that's exactly what happens in mentor discipleship relationships and in the church. But we're going to have to work really hard to that our character, we develop our character so that we can walk worthy of the vocation or the calling that is on our lives. So now we go to number two. Jesus gives us power. Everybody say power. power. Now, the word in the scripture is authority, but I translated power because it can go either way, really. And let's read the scripture in Matthew chapter 10 in the second half of verse 1 and onward. And gave them authority to drive out evil spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. These are the names of the twelve apostles. First, Simon, who is called Peter, and his brother Andrew. 
James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Now, in these verses, we see something about authority. Authority equals power. And that power is given for three principal purposes here. Number one, to drive out evil spirits. And we have power to tread on serpents, the scripture says. Metaphorically meaning we have ultimate dominion over any demon spirit without exception. Never let the devil tell you that some demons are inconquerable. Some demons you're just not going to be able to, they're too strong for you. That's a lie from the pits of hell. There are no demon spirits on this planet that are stronger than the Jesus that is in you because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. So therefore you can conclude if you're wrestling and have trouble, you have one person to blame and that's you. And I'm not criticizing you because I also blame myself. I still have problems. But there was a time in my Christian life when I actually did blame the devil. And it was so easy for me to say the devil made me do it. It was so evil, easy for me to say of the demon spirits that there's a spirit and if I, I just need deliverance and if I get deliverance, I won't. Yes, that's true. There is the time for deliverance. But I'm talking about a mindset and an understanding the authority that he was giving his disciples at this moment was to drive out evil spirits, to have absolute control. In fact, that was the most impressive thing to them because it's the first thing they mentioned when they came back to him. They said, even the spirits are subject to us in your name. Jesus wasn't impressed. He said, oh, so what? I saw Satan kicked out of heaven. I threw him out like nothing. He's just a punk. <laughs> Rejoice not that they're subject to you, but that your names are written in heaven. See, the eternal life was the priority, but we get caught up on that. But authority was given to us. He gives us power to drive out evil spirits. Number two, to heal every disease and sickness. I love the every part. That means there is no sickness and no disease on this planet that God cannot heal through you. You. It's easy to think, well, there might be some super anointed evangelist prophet and they have the anointing to bring healing, but I don't know about me. Well, then you better know and you better learn and learn the scriptures that he wants to give you the power and authority over all sickness and all disease. And, and we have this power to heal every sickness, every kind of disease known to man. But just because we have a thing does not mean we use a thing. You may have that power, but it does not mean you're using it. There are tools in your house that you're not using. In fact, have you ever had a tool in your house and you desperately need it, but you don't remember where you put it? And sometimes that's what it's like with Christians concerning the power of healing in their lives. But if you use it frequently, you know where that tool is or that thing is in your house, and so you put it in an important place. The reason you don't know where that tool is to do the job that you need to do is because you don't frequently use it, and so therefore it gets lost in the shuffle of your belongings and you don't know where that special tool is. But if it's a tool you use every day, you know exactly where the tool is, so it becomes more handy to you. It's the same with the miracle power for healing. It's the same with the healing ministry. You can ask believers, have, have you, have you, you, they can come and say, I want to be used of the Lord to bring healing. I want to lay hands on the sick and see them recover. Okay? Okay, well, then uh, how many people have you seen healed? Well, nobody yet. Then say, how many people have you actually prayed for? Well, nobody yet. Well, then how do you expect people to get healed if you're not practicing? Keep practicing. Whether they get healed or not, that's not your responsibility. Pray for everything sick there is. Pray for it. And believe me, when you first start, you might pray for somebody who's sick and they die the next day. And you feel like you killed them. <laughs> you didn't. They were going to die anyway. Don't worry about it. You just need to be practical and do the things the Lord's called you to do. And the Lord watches and begins to reward you with supernatural backing up from heaven to make the miracle real. But we have been given that power. This is what Jesus gives us. Number three, and where it says in the verse, these are the names. It's interesting that something caught my attention. We have power of reputation and name. It specifically names the people who were there that day, the disciples, and who they were. Why couldn't it just say the disciples? 
We know who the disciples are. Why do they have to name all 12 of them one by one? And that's what caught my attention and made me think that we become known and trusted because of the gift of God within us and use this to establish his kingdom. Now, there are, right now, and it's funny, this just popped into my head, so I'm just going to say it. There are demon spirits right now that, that are becoming afraid of Caleb. The Lord just told me that. That there are demon spirits right now that they're starting to tremble because Caleb is learning some tricks and some secrets from Revelation. And they once thought they had him bound. They thought they had conquered him, but they've lost. And I see them running like little squealing pigs, and they're running away and will never bother Caleb again. They are not coming back. Why? Because of Revelation. Not just Caleb, that's true for a lot of us. And now our names become known. We are marked and written in heaven, and also then... On earth, people begin to know us. I'm known here already in Singapore. People know who Stephen is. Certain pastors, some pastors don't like me. That's okay. But there's some pastors who do like me. And there are people you can become known. A good friend of mine, Ed Pusson, that name is known in this nation. And just about anybody I talk to, I say, you know Ed Pusson? Oh, yeah. That's a reputation and a good one. And this is what the Lord gives us. That's part of the authority and power. The Bible says that He gives us rapport with men. He establishes us. Do you ever have people suddenly, just they just love you and you don't even know why. You didn't do anything. They're just, they just crazy about you. And dimensions of the Spirit. I'm not talking about lust now. You know, I'm, I'm, talking about, I'm talking about in the kingdom. I've had that happen often. When I see that and there seems to be an extraordinary amount of attention coming from a person toward me and they seem kind of big-eyed, and excited about Pastor Stephen, I'm not quick to dismiss that because I don't do it. It is the hand of God causing someone to see and setting them up to receive the gifts of this. That's authority. That's the power that he gives us to drive out evil spirits, to heal every sickness and disease, and to establish our names on the earth as people called and separated by God. Amen? So number one, we saw that Jesus gives us a call. Number two, we see that Jesus gives us power, that is authority. Number three, Jesus gives us orders. Everybody say orders. orders. And when I say orders, I mean like yes sir, no sir. Like military orders. Because once we come into an alliance with Jesus and we let Jesus in our boat and we let him wear the captain's hat, then he no longer asks, can he come in the boat? He starts telling us, you cast out into the deep and throw that net at us. He starts speaking the imperative and giving us orders. Jesus gives us orders. Matthew chapter 10, verse 5. It says, these 12, the ones we just mentioned, Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Ever say instructions? instructions? We have instructions. Do not go among the Gentiles or into any, any town of the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. So look at instructions now. He gives it a do not and a go. Do not. Jesus gives us specific instructions and expects us to obey when he says for us to not do something. There are limitations. There are borders or places that, lines that Jesus marks for us and says, I don't want you to go past this line. I don't want you to do this thing in your life. Now, whether we obey or not, I don't know. The disciples did not have to listen to this instruction. The disciples could have gone anyway. To do whatever they wanted, where it, where it said there very clearly, do not go among the Gentiles and enter any town of the Samaritans. The disciples could have and had the faculty in themselves to disobey and go there anyway. And they could have just guessed, you know what, Jesus doesn't really know what he's talking about. I know some Samaritan people, they're okay. Let's just go there and he won't know. No, see, that's not good. I know there's places I'm not supposed to be on earth. And I might be a, a multinational missionary and I may go from country to country, but there's places I don't belong. And I know that because God stops me from going there. Even if I think I want to go there, suddenly I feel the Lord says, no, you don't go there. Now maybe in the future he'll let me go because as you know, the Samaritans are reached later on and he does let the disciples go. But instructions are dispensational or for epochs and times of your life, instructions need to be followed. And he will give you instructions. As it says, 
Listen to the prohibition of the Lord. When He prohibits you from doing something, make sure you follow that. And this is not the law, it's grace produced prompting from the Holy Spirit. Grace produced prompting that comes out of grace. He urges you and causes you to feel a feeling from the Holy Spirit to not do certain things. Paul experienced this when he wanted to go to Asia and he said this, this says the Spirit of the Lord forbade him from going. Acts chapter, um, Acts chapter 16. Thank you very much. Acts chapter 16. The Spirit of the Lord stopped him from going. And also, um, we, we see that when the Lord speaks to us, He gives us that feeling. We know. How many of you know what I'm talking about? You know when you're not supposed to do a thing. How many of you have done it anyway? <laughs> then what happened? You feel miserable. You know. The moment you did it, oh, no. You know you're in trouble. God doesn't kill you. He doesn't come down, you know, Gabriel doesn't fly down with a big silver hammer and crush your skull. But you do get kind of a cold shoulder, don't you? You feel kind of a, a standing off from the Lord. Until when? Until you repent. And the instant you repent, He's there. He doesn't even hesitate. He comes. Because that's how much He loves us. But still, it's better to, to please Him all the time. And when He says go, we need to go. Equally, Jesus gives an instruction, or gives us instructions about where to go and how to minister. And these are specifics concerning our vision and function, details to guide us. And God is the God of specifics, not the God of generalities. He will tell you exactly what you need to know. I say this because it's true. The Lord gave me detailed instruction in the life of Hezekiah for my ministry in Acapulco. I had seven years. I was talking about this in the class the other day. I had seven years there to minister in Acapulco, to plant that church. Before I ever went, he said, you're going to be here for seven years. He was so specific about that. He said, you're going to be here for seven years, and you're going to plant a church, but it's going to be difficult. It's going to take three years for you to get that church even started. And when you do start it, it's going to be slow going, little by little, but all of a sudden, I am going to invest in it, and there's going to be a great explosion of power, and it's going to cause a great fire and when that fire rises, out of the flames will come embers, and those embers will float on the heat of the flames, and they will settle in places surrounding that fire, and they will all be works that are planted in churches. New fires will be born out of that first fire that you planted. And he told me, and in seven years, and after that, he didn't tell me what was coming after that. He knew better to keep India hidden for a while. <laughs> he didn't want to discourage me too early in the game. But he then, then he took me, and you know, he told me all that in a hotel room. In the hotel that we were in. What was the name of the hotel again, Barbara? Do you remember? Was it Los Flamingos? Or? Was it Los Flamingos? No, that was the expensive place, thing up on the hill that we never even went in the door of. Las <laughs> Brisas. Not, oh, Las Brisas is the expensive one. We stay at Los Flamingos, the old, you know, the Hotel Podrido allá in La Montaña. Yeah, that, that we stayed in this old funky hotel. But that, in that hotel, the Lord spoke to me spoke to me those instructions and they were very specific and then he said to me look at the life of Hezekiah because it's the pattern you're going to live and I studied Hezekiah inside out back and forth up and down and did you know that every element of the ministry of Hezekiah I say ministry his kingship everything he went through I went through everything he suffered I suffered I had my rapture I had Sennacherib send the servant rapture to yell at me from the wall it was one of the neighbors there who threatened me and said he was going to kill me. And I had everything in the story of Hezekiah. I lived it. And it was like living a script that I already had the screenplay for. It was glorious. It was good. Because I could predict very clearly what was coming up. And everything that happened there did. And it was wonderful. Except for one thing. God did not come to me and say that I was going to die. And then give me more years. You know, that was part of that story. But everything else was so clear about what the Lord did. And God wants to give you instructions like that. He wants to lead you. If you listen carefully to the voice of God, He will tell you exactly what to do and what not to do. It's the still small voice also. We read this in, I read it yesterday in, in the one year Bible plan in Matthew 10, 27, where it says, what I tell you in the dark, speak in the daylight. What is whispered in your ear, proclaim from the roofs, meaning that when God speaks to you and He gives you these instructions, He's going to whisper them in your ear. 
God is not blowing a trumpet in your ear. He doesn't have like one of those party horns, you know, that <laughs> horn. He doesn't put that in your ear, blow it. He whispers a still, small voice, but it is specific. He will reveal to you what he wants for you. Number four, Jesus gives us a message. Everybody say, a message. A message. Did you know that he's already given us all the message that we need? Did you already, I know you're worried about what messages am I supposed to preach. And, and no, the message is simple. And here it goes. As you go, preach this message. This is pretty specific. He's saying preach this message. He didn't say as you go, preach any message you want. Just preach whatever. It doesn't matter. No, he says as you go, preach this message. The kingdom of heaven is near. Heal the sick. Raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. It says, preach this message. The kingdom of heaven is near. In other words, the eternal dimension of God is here with us now. It's here with us now. Another translation says, preach the kingdom of God is at hand. I like that even better, which means that it's so close that I can reach out and I can touch it with my hand. God's eternal kingdom is here for us. And this is our message. It's another way of saying it, the eternal dimension. It's, it is our simple message. Surrounding this concept is everything else. The reason for Jesus and his death, burial, and resurrection was to give us access to this dimension so that we can be forever with God. That's reconciliation. There was separation. We were not able to go to eternity. And the kingdom of God was not near us at all. So the good news of the gospel was, guess what? The kingdom is now right here. And Jesus could say that and put it through them because that's what he came to establish and open the door so that the veil and the temple could be ripped in half so that eternity and time would be in the same place at the same time in a basement in Bishan right now. So that we could have the spiritual presence of God and every, that's what Jesus paid for. And this is followed when we share this message. When I share, it is true, every time I focus on this and share this, what happens? It's followed by the miraculous manifestation of God's power that results in healing, dead raising, cleansing of leprosy, and deliverance. You say, I haven't seen you raise a dead. Well, have you brought any dead people to me? <laughs> Get some dead people. Bring them in here. Let's see what happens. I know there's some legality that we have to concern ourselves with, and maybe, you know, but if you want to bring dead bodies in here, I would be happy to have you bring dead people in here, and I will preach, and we will lay hands on them. Isn't that right, Paul? Yeah, yeah. Okay, there we go. We'll go to the streets away. I don't mind praying for the dead. That same thing with any other sickness or disease. We are always ready and able to lay hands on the sick. We believe it. The message is... First, the kingdom of God is at hand. And then he says what's going to happen. If you really get this revelation that eternity is now here, and we have access to God's realm, then out of that realm will come supernatural things, which mean healing all these events that we see. Number five, Jesus gives us provision. Everybody said provision. Provision. Provision is a good thing. Matthew chapter 10, verse 9 says, Do not take along any gold or silver or copper in your belts. Take no bag for the journey or extra tunic or sandals or staff for the worker is worth his keep. Amen. Now here the scripture is talking about the fact that Jesus gives us the assurance of constant faithful provision without end when we connect to his kingdom in obedience to his call. And I say this, like right now we have no money but need a new home in Singapore. I stand tonight in this moment of course, if I ever use this message online, I'm going to have to take that off because God is going to do the miracle and then it won't be redundant to hand it up there. But we have no money to pay for the move we're about to do. And we have our lease is coming in. The owners want the house back. They're moving back in. So we're going to be homeless in about a month if we don't find another place and the prices are high. We don't have, you know, first month move. You got deposit and first month's rent and the agent if you use an agent. And, you know, you're talking about thousands and thousands of dollars. It could be as much as $15,000 that I'm going to need in one month. And you think, but, but are you worried? No, I'm not real. I could care less. Because I know from, in 27 years of experience in the, in the dozens and dozens of times that we've moved, I lost count of how many places, it always is provided. There will always be a ram in the thicket. I don't even sweat it anymore. I don't even care. So what? It'll work out. I told my wife today, I said, you know what? Just, just get whatever you want. It's like we're worried about, well, what's our budget? 
We have no budget. We don't have any money to begin with. <laughs> Basically, whatever we do, God's going to provide. Yes, we're being reasonable and we're thinking in a certain budget that is, you know, pretty much at par with what we're seeing across the nation for us to be able to live. But still, whatever. I know whatever we get, whatever we choose, God will provide every need. And this is because I am doing what he called me to do in his kingdom and I'm walking in the footsteps that he put out there for me and he gives me that assurance of constant faithful provision without end. And you know, it's funny, the devil comes and tells you, yeah, but now, finally, that's it. It's over now. <laughs> He's been telling me that for 27 years. <laughs> Every single time we're up against a, a, an important need that has to be paid, the devil comes and says, that's it, it's over. That's it, Grace ran out. I don't even know why he keeps coming back. Part of me must be listening to him because he keeps coming back. And sure enough, I get a little worried sometimes, but I've just really gotten so worn out with his same words and they never come to pass. So why even listen to him anymore? I'm just not even listening to him. I trust that what Jesus has come to do, he will complete. Amen? Amen. You just sit back and watch. Give, give me a couple of months, and after it's all said and done, and I have you over to my house, and we do a supper club over there, and you all come, and you'll see, and you'll think, how did you get in this beautiful house? And I say, oh, it's Jesus. It's all Jesus. Couldn't it pick? It's going to be better than anything we've ever had before. It's going to be, I'm not even worried about it. Even if I were out on the street, I wouldn't be worried about it because I still have Jesus. Yeah. And he's all I ever need. But Jesus also, because I seek him first, will give me everything that the pagans are running after. All the things that everybody else is dying for and begging for and working their fingers to the bone for, he's going to give to me freely and provide it for me. And I'm thankful for that. He always has. He always will. Number six. Jesus gives us a method. Everybody say method. He does. We are not Methodists, but he does give us a method. And this is what I mean by that. Verse 11 continues. Whatever town or village you enter, search for some worthy person there and stay at his house until you leave. As you enter the home, give it your greeting. If the home is deserving, let your peace rest on it. If it is not, let your peace return to you. If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, shake the dust off your feet. When you leave that home or town, I tell you the truth, it will be more bearable for Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that town. And that's a method. You understand? He's given us a structure here. This is a simple method of operation in the formation of your alliance or alliances that are your ministry on earth. You come in relationship. If you follow this method, your will um, method, you, it should say, you will not be misled. Sorry for all the typos. So you will not be misdirected or misled if you do what the Lord tells you to do in the formation of relationships. So this, actually, what you see there in that verse is this is complete dependence upon the Holy Spirit to lead and guide you and for the anointing of the Spirit to be the force that determines your relationships and steps with people. And I lived this method and have practiced it for 27 years. Back up to the verse for me. Look at, look at it actually says there. So it's very simple. Whatever town or village. Let's just equate town and village is in relationships and social circles with people. Whatever social group you go to, because it's representative of a town, maybe people at a job, people in your school, or whatever. You have circles of friends that you form. When you go to that circle of friends, search for some worthy person there and stay at his house until you leave. Maybe not his physical house, but let's say that you stay in relationship with that person. And when you meet them, you start to spend time with them. And as you do, you enter that relationship in that home. You give it your greeting. And if the home or the relationship is deserving, you let your peace rest on. In other words, the anointing on you will flow out. And it's going to do one of two things. It will be absorbed and received or rejected. And if it is rejected, that means you need to follow this method and continue to do what it says. You let your peace come back. In other words, you can take the anointing that you let out of you, and this is, I've done this physically, and I can feel it when it happens. I have let the anointing out, and have had it just kind of roam around the room and come back to me, and I feel it come back to me. It's the strangest sensation, but when it happens, I know it happens. And I let that anointing back in, and suddenly I'm anointed. I feel like somebody's giving me the anointing. Because it went out and come back in. 
It's the peace that's on us, the peace of God. And, and concerning the peace, you've heard my testimony before in India that time. The pastor didn't want me to pray for the people who received the anointing or the Holy Spirit. He said, we don't believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit said, ask the pastor if you can preach on the peace of God. And I did. I said, Pastor, is it okay if I just preach on the peace of God? He says, yes, you can teach on the, preach, the peace of God. And I did. And I talked about the peace. Everywhere I would usually say anointing and Holy Spirit, I'd say the peace of God. And the peace of God comes down from heaven in great power and comes upon you. And you receive the peace of God in your heart. God's peace will well up in you like a river of living water. And it's because it's all applicable, it's true. And then the altar call is, is there anyone here today who wants to receive the peace of God? And every hand went up. And I turned to the pastor and I said, is that okay? And I had it. It was a technicality. So he looked at me and he said, yeah, reluctantly. He gave me the okay. And I prayed for them. And, and more than half of this congregation began to speak in tongues. <laughs> Whoops. That's Because this is what the peace of God is. This is what it's talking about. And the method that he gives them is all about the ebb and flow of the anointing and the manifestation of God's power through you to form relationships, to keep relationships, to stop relationships. If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, and by the way, you speak the words and he backs it up with the anointing. The words are, because remember the anointing is voice activated, so you speak it about the power of God. It comes out, and if they don't listen to your words and don't receive you, then you shake the dust off your feet when you leave that home or that town or that relationship. Walk away from it. I tell you the truth, it will be more bearable for Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that town. And this is a method he gives us. And then we're going to finish with number seven, then we're going to pray. Jesus gives us a warning. Everybody say, a warning. A warning. Yeah, I hate to end on kind of a sour note, but this is how the scripture goes. He gives us a warning. And he says in Matthew chapter 10, verse 16, I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. Be on your guard against men. They will hand you over to the local councils and flog you in their synagogues. On my account, you will be brought before governors and kings as witnesses to them and to the Gentiles. But when they arrest you, do not worry about what to say or how to say it. At that time, you will be given what to say. For it will not be you speaking, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. It says there, be on your guard against men. And I notice this. Notice that no mention was made here or anywhere for us to be aware or to beware of demons. In fact, as I ran across this, I realized there's no place that Jesus warns us about demon spirits. No place in the Bible does Jesus say, be careful with the demons. No, on the contrary, he says, don't even regard them. He said, no, so what? Don't, don't worry about it. Rejoice that your name is written in him. He doesn't even consider, because when he said, he, I give you all authority to tread upon scorpions and, and over every demon, he meant it. It was absolute, like I said earlier. And, and the fact is that Jesus conquered the power of the enemy completely on the cross and through his resurrection. Now, not everyone has this concept, by the way. Not every believer carries this doctrine. And I've had believers stand up in defense for the demons and fight on their behalf. Yeah, I know, and you're thinking, what? Yep. I've had them argue with me and tell me that, no, you understand, there are, these, there are some demons you have to be very careful. Better watch out. Beware of the demons. In this country, there's really strong demons and you don't understand. What are you telling me? I lived in India for six years. I know what's there. I, I've, I've come face to face with the demons. I mean, they've stood at me. I've heard voices. Them speak to me audibly. I know the demons. I laugh at them. I said, that's really cute that you think I'm going to be fearful of you. You're like, what do you think? You think I'm stupid? I know who you are, and I know who Jesus is, and he shed his blood. As soon as I start talking blood, they run. Because I know. And I've been in many countries, many places. And you have a choice. You submit to demons or you... You know, without, as I say, the scripture says, without faith it's impossible to please God. It's the same with the devil and his demons. Without faith in them, it's impossible to please them. You have to believe in them to empower them. And I'm believing what the scripture says. 
I'm believing what Jesus tells me. And the problem is with men who want to hurt the people of God. And there are always evil people seeking to hurt us and we have to use great wisdom to be safe. In other words, demon or not, when a guy decides to beat you with a club, he's going to beat you with a club. And I got news for you, not even the anointing is going to stop that from happening. If that were case, the case that Paul would have never been beaten because he was a very anointed man of God. Why? Because the greatest gift ever given to man is free will, and free will will never be overcome even by the Spirit of the Lord. I know that's kind of disturbing, and that's why Jesus is warning them. Look, you have all this power. You can do anything and anything, but uh, one thing. Watch out for bad guys. That's what Jesus said. But even their actions, even those things will be used of the Lord. Like sheep among wolves, shrewd as snakes, and as innocent as doves, so we are snaky doves. <laughs> we're like doves, but we're also sneaky we're sneaky doves. I thought about trying to come up with a visual for that. I was going to do some artwork and do like a half snake, half dove hybrid creature, but no. Consider these animals in their nature and you'll get the meaning of this directive. Snakes, extremely careful and stealth, hardly ever seen. You rarely see snakes. There are hundreds of snakes out there, but you won't see them. You're only going to see one out of a hundred. And maybe even less than that. Why? Because snakes are always hiding. Snakes are just sneaking off. That's why we get the expression, sneaky snake. Because they're sneaky, 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 sneaky. And they sneak. And I used to be a snake hunter for a while. That's what I did. I collected snakes for money. I would connect, collect the snakes. I would collect hundreds of them and sell them by weight. I would sell water snakes. I would sell poisonous snakes and non-poisonous snakes. I, I knew how to handle the snakes and I'd collect them. And they're very hard to find. On a snake hunt, sometimes I would come back from snake-infested woods with no snakes. <laughs> because they were so hard because of those reasons. So we have to be that way. We have to just be stealth. We need to sneak in, sneak out. We need to show up and just disappear. We need to be stealthful. But we also need to be a dove, which is gentle and devoted, always faithful to their mates, never do harm to anyone. Did you know that a dove chooses a mate for life? And it will never, in fact, if you take a dove and you kill its mate, that dove will stay where that dove died for the rest of its life. It will be very hard to get rid of the dove because it's waiting for the return of its one and only love. They're amazing. Doves are faithful. Doves are gentle. You can grab, have you ever held a dove in your hands? It's amazing. You can reach into a cage and grab a dove and it will do nothing to defend itself. And you could crush it to death if you wanted to. And it would never peck you or try. It, it would just let you kill it. And that's why Jesus used this example. That we need to be like that. Innocent, gentle, devoted, always faithful, but also extremely careful and stealth. So we need to be, as I say, snaky doves or dovey snakes, if you want to look at that. <laughs> and so it says, do not worry. And we're finishing with this. Do not worry about what to say or how to say it. At that time, you will be given what to say. For it will not be you speaking, but the Spirit of your Father speaking to you. So if we obey the method given by Jesus, we will naturally yield to this empowering, and he will speak through us. Don't depend on your own intelligence of ability. Don't look to yourself and say, I can do this. I can. No, you need to trust the Spirit of the Lord. It won't be you speaking. Just relax. We put ourselves in positions of the impossible. And God makes it possible, not by might, not by power, but by His Spirit in operation through us. And this is what Jesus gave. This knowledge, these things, we see them in review. Number one, Jesus gives us a call. Number two, Jesus gives us power. Number three, Jesus gives us orders. Number four, Jesus gives us a message. Number five, Jesus gives us money. I said provision earlier, but he does, money. Number six, Jesus gives us a method. And number seven, Jesus gives us a warning. These seven things the Lord has given to us as he sends us out. And everybody in this room is sent out for the purpose. Every single one of us have a purpose and we need to go, we need to do what the Lord is telling us to do and all these things apply to everyone. Amen? Amen. Why don't we stand on our feet? I want us to pray tonight.
The Lord's presence is here with us. His word is sure. And as he called his 12 disciples together to empower them, he's called us into this place. The Lord told me about this coming year, 2012, that he was going to gather a group of people out of this church and he was going to empower them. There are going to be a small group of ministers and it doesn't mean that if you're not in that group that you're not called of God. That's not the point, but he does it in levels, in stages. It has a lot to do with the disposition of the people. But God is singling out individuals and he's empowering them to do some amazing things. And I'm going to work very hard to see those people become what they need to become. And the Spirit of the Lord is establishing them. It's not by what I want. It's not what I want. It's not what Pastor Paul wants. We don't make choices anymore. Paul and I were just talking at a meeting today. We were talking about that. Man, for the last couple of years, we stopped making choices. We just go with the flow. And it's such a peace. It's such a rest now. We're just yielding to the Spirit. And the doors are flying open. And provisions coming. And there's a manifestation like never before of His power and His glory. And to live that pattern in that way, we have to do exactly like the disciples of Jesus, these things we just saw. And we come under them. Lord, we thank You for We thank You, Jesus, for calling us. You have called us and separated us. You've given us all of these things. You've empowered us. And you've given us a method and a message. And, and you've given us provision. And you're going to as we trust you and obey. You've given us instructions. Lord, reveal your instructions to every person in this room tonight. Thank you, Lord, for, for Valerie taking steps to do amazing things. Thank you, Lord, for, for Caleb stepping forward to do great. Thank you for Ben and Anne and the sacrifices they're making to make steps forward to do great things. Lord, thank you for, for Stephen and Pastor Paul. And thank you for Angel and Carmen and what they're doing for the Lord. People that are leaving behind their lives in sacrifice to the Lord so that they can go forward and do the things of God. You've called us separate. You've drawn us to you. And you said, I give you power. I give you power to go and to preach and to heal the sick and to drive out demons. And Lord, we believe this. And we yield to the power. We yield to the anointing. So that peace will be on us and flow out of us. Jesus, right where you are, if you want the anointing of God to increase in your life, just stand up, raise your hands to the Lord and say, I receive your authority. I receive your power, Lord. That's in this place right now. In the name of Jesus, let heaven rain down upon me. Empower me. That this moment Jesus decided, and I'm no longer going to exclusively walk in this power, but I'm going to give it to my disciples. He's doing that here and now with us. No longer is the anointing for the elite pastor, teacher, preacher, but it's for everyone who's responding to the call of God. And He's empowering you. He's anointing you. As Paul said earlier, he's working from the bottom up. He's coming up from underneath. Some pastors have to plead and beg for their people to do something for God and push them, but we're being pushed by you people. You're the one saying we have to serve, we have to go, we have to do. And that's because we have invited the Spirit of the living God into this place. And he's made himself at home. And he's manifesting his glory and his power. And he's setting us on fire from heaven. are so grateful. So grateful, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Yes. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your great love for us. We thank you for your great love for us, Jesus. Let's just sing about his love. Your love, Lord. Reaches. Reaches to
speaking to me. And the reason I'm telling you the story is because the Spirit of the Lord is telling me to tell you that He wants that deal with every one of you. He wants that deal with that, you to understand. As you worry sometimes, some of you worry, well, you know, the anointing's here for this season, and I don't want you feared the future where you might have to look back and say, remember when we had the visitation? Remember when the Lord was there and you've been afraid, but the Lord's telling you just what He told me tonight. He's telling you that He will never leave you as long as you make Him welcome. Even through your sinful seasons, even through your rebellion, even through your problems, even through your weakest moments, as long as you honor His presence and welcome Him in your life, He will never stop coming. Yes, Lord. Oh, Jesus.